I now have the uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Simon Baron Cohen. Uh, he's Professor of Developmental Psychopathology and Director of the Autism Research Center at the University of Cambridge. And the title of his talk is ASD versus ASC is one small letter important. So thank you very much, Richard, for um, organizing this symposium for your wonderful keynote this morning. Thank you to Sally Osnoff for inviting Richard. Um, and uh, I just want to also pay tribute to John. Uh, it was a real privilege to meet you last night at supper. Um, it was a very moving presentation this morning. Um, I probably speak for many people in the room in saying that um, I cried during your presentation. Uh, and it's got some very important messages. So um, I'm going to be talking about this topic of uh, autism spectrum disorder versus autism spectrum condition. I'm going to start off with just a couple of images to remind us of um, what we're looking at. So here we have almost the archetypal image of a child with autism um, who is playing alone, who's not part of his peer group, but I just want to um, comment that I think he's doing something very intelligent in his behavior. He's making patterns. One more image, and then we'll get started. Again, a child not really part of his peer group, but again, I think doing something intelligent in his behavior, playing with water, changing the flow of water with his hands, making patterns. So I'm going to discuss really the issue of um, the language we use to describe autism. So it's an examination of the terminology that we have inherited. This is a caveat that I'm really just giving you a personal point of view. Other researchers, uh, professionals um, should be free to make their own choice of terminology. I may be giving you a sort of cultural different perspective because in the UK, uh, there's a growing interest in using the phrase autism spectrum condition rather than autism spectrum disorder. And I think by the end of uh, today, we should also be asking the autism community what kind of terminology would they like. Let's also remind ourselves about life before DSM, that back in 1943, Canna just called it autism. DSM-4 changed it to autistic disorder, and it's the word disorder I'm going to focus on. Lorna Wing, 1981, I think the first scientific article looking at Asperger's syndrome, she just called it Asperger's syndrome. DSM changed it to Asperger disorder. And as you know, DSM loves the term disorder. Um, you can find hundreds of examples in the DSM what we used to call dyslexia is now reading disorder. What we used to call dyscalculia is now mathematics disorder. What we used to call depression is major depressive disorder. What we used to call autism is autism spectrum disorder. And my favorite, <laughs> um, <laughs> if you get a bit angry, you might be diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder, which conjures up all kinds of images. Um, DSM-1 through to DSM-5 has seen an increase in the numbers of uh, mental disorders. Remember, this is the manual, statistical manual for mental disorders. I find this very 19th century kind of language, but you can see this systematic increase from the first edition. It's kind of uh, trebled. 106 disorders were listed in DSM-1, and now we're up to 300. So what is my issue? Well, let's start with some definitions. The definition of the word disorder either is given as the lack of order or intelligent pattern. Does this apply to autism? Another definition of disorder is randomness. It's a lack of order. And I would question whether this is really the, the word we want to be using in relation to autism. And I've been using in publications over the last 15 years or so um, the phrase condition instead of disorder. The definition of the word condition is a state of being. And I think this word is less hard hitting when I diagnose people in our clinic 
I don't tell them they have a disorder, I tell them they have a condition. I think it's a little bit more gentle, less stigmatizing, more respectful, and it carries fewer value judgments. It's a bit more neutral. The word condition could be, for example, what is the condition of your health? Well, it's fine, thank you very much. What is the condition of your economy? It's doing pretty well. Or it could be that there are some difficulties. It's a more neutral term. What I'm going to do in my presentation is go through 10 arguments for and against the term disorder and uh, leave you to decide the terminology you want to use. So the first um, argument that people use about why we should retain the term disorder is it reminds us that autism has a biological cause or set of causes. Well, I would argue that the term condition does that just as well that the term condition is often used in medicine. For example, I have a heart condition, tells us straight away that we're talking about a biomedical set of causes. Second argument that people say is we should use the word disorder because it signals severity. We're not just talking about something mild, we're talking about something that can be really severe. Again, I would argue that the term condition also implies degrees of severity. For example, we might say I have a severe heart condition, so I can no longer walk 10 steps. But to me, that's pretty severe. And we should also remember that whenever we make a diagnosis of any condition, the symptoms have to be interfering with the person's daily functioning to warrant the diagnosis. So it's not as if when we use the term condition, there's necessarily any less, uh, an implication of it being less severe. The third, third argument is that the term disorder reminds us that there is suffering for the person. And there is no question that for people with autism, many of the associated features do cause suffering. Let's just be absolutely clear about that. I've listed just some of those associated features like epilepsy, self-injury, mutism or very minimal verbal communication, gastrointestinal pain, and uh, in some of the rare genetic syndromes. But do we need the word disorder to cover the whole of the autism spectrum? Well, I would argue that the term disorder isn't um, doing sufficient work for us because not all cases of autism involve these associated features that may cause real suffering and pain. You can see some of the comorbidity prevalence statistics on this slide. Epilepsy is, um, uh, in various different studies, seen in between about 8 and 30% of cases of autism. Self-injury, less than 50%. Mutism, it's not clear from different studies, but is probably low in, in rate. Gastrointestinal pain may be extremely common, but different studies report uh, frequencies as low as 9% through to 70%. And genetic syndromes that can really cause suffering, again, seem to only be about 5% of the autism spectrum. So the term disorder as a signal of suffering, again, may not be sufficient to cover the, the, uh, everyone that we think of as having autism. The fourth argument is that if we use the term disorder it reminds us that we're talking about a disability. Well, I think that Maureen's talk today was very important in um, situating autism within the framework and uh, the, the model of disability. But I don't think this is, uh, uh, this is restricted to the word disorder. The term condition also implies that someone might have a disability, as in my heart condition causes me to have a physical disability. I have to be in a wheelchair, for example. What's the fifth argument? Well, the term disorder carries with it the implication that something is broken or dysfunctional, in this case, in the brain. Again, I'm not sure that the scientific evidence really justifies that view. My reading of the neurobiology and the psychology of autism mostly shows me that we see difference but not dysfunction or something broken. I'm just giving you a few different examples. This is a study by uh, Nordahl and colleagues uh, in the Archives of General Psychiatry, that learned journal founded by Richard's grandfather, 
uh, but showing us that the amygdala in autism is larger, both on the right and the left, compared to the typical brain. So we're seeing a difference in size of a brain structure, but is that really a sign of something being broken or dysfunctional? Really, we're just seeing a difference. This uh, is the corpus callosum, which many studies, I've listed 10 of them here, report is smaller in the autistic brain than in the typical brain. So we're seeing a difference in size, it's a difference, but that's not necessarily showing us um, that something's broken or dysfunctional. Even if you go down to the, um, the level of individual neurons, post-mortem study, uh, this one comes from Tang and colleagues in 2014, we can see the autistic neuron um, on your right, your left, and the typical neuron um, on your right. And what you can see is examples of reduced pruning, at least that's how the authors interpret it, um, that all of those little white dots that you can see are more numerous on the autistic neuron are uh, locations of dendritic spines, more synapses between one neuron and its neighbors. So more connections, less pruning in autistic development. But this is just a difference. It's not telling us when we look at the data that this is a sign of dysfunction or something being broken. And if we take this example um, from uh, back in 2011, Samson and colleagues who put people with autism into the scanner and simply played them single tones to see how the auditory cortex responds. What they reported was that the, the, in the autistic brain we see a greater response in auditory cortex simply to hearing tones. Again, what we're seeing here is difference, but not necessarily something being broken. The sixth argument uh, for disor disorder, in defense of using the word disorder, um, is that uh, it's picking out some people are normal and some people have a disorder. It's that very binary approach that Richard talked about this morning. But I think this overlooks that there are actually many different ways uh, to be normal, that there are many diverse neurotypical or neuroatypical cognitive styles. And as we heard in John's talk, uh, each of these have their advantages and their disadvantages. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. We're very familiar from the research in psychology looking at global versus local processing. This is the familiar embedded figures test uh, where people on the autism spectrum are actually faster and more accurate at finding the parts within the whole. Um, and our, it, it, this is taken as evidence of a different cognitive style, not something broken or dysfunctional, and which actually leads to superior performance. Interestingly, when you run that same study during fMRI, uh, what you see on average in, the per, in people with autism is that they're showing less cortical activity in posterior parietal cortex whilst they're showing superior performance on the task. So a difference in, in cognitive style. And here's one other example from Karen Pierce's lab at, at uh, San Diego, showing that even if you look at a very early point in development, under two years old, at whether kids coming into the clinic who are receiving a diagnosis of autism pay more attention to people or to objects, you find a difference in attentional style that kids with autism spend longer looking at objects than they do at people. This isn't showing us something's broken or something's dysfunctional. It's just showing us a difference in attentional style. Here's the seventh argument. I'm watching Richard for time. There's only 10 of these. Um, that the term disorder is reminding us that there is nothing positive about the experience, the lived experience of autism. But I think this does uh, overlook that autism does involve disabilities, it does involve challenges that need support, but there's also evidence of talent in autism and that this is incompatible with the term disorder. I'm just going to give you one example of this, that on a task where kids with Asperger's syndrome were asked to figure out how these mechanical systems worked, these are 12-year-old kids with Asperger's syndrome, they performed at a higher level compared to typical kids in, in uh, correctly identifying, in this case, that the wheel, um, when turning anti-clockwise, will cause that uh, point P to move 
forward and backward, so figuring out novel systems um, more accurately than a typical child. The term disorder also implies that there are cognitive deficits. Um, the literature is full of examples of this. I don't think that we need the term disorder to signal that. I think the term condition is not incompatible with the notion of cognitive deficits. And this is an example from our own group. We have a poster um, in parallel to this session showing that on the eyes test, being able to recognize emotions from expressions around the eyes, people with autism show reduced performance evidence of a cognitive deficit, but this is perfectly captured by the term condition. We don't need the term disorder. Penultimate argument is that the term disorder helps remind us that there is serious psychiatric risk associated with autism. Again, I think the term condition can do this just as well, that disorder isn't the only word that reminds us of the serious um, risks to people um, with autism. You can use the phrase, I have a mental health condition, just as clearly as I have a mental health disorder. And in a study that we published uh, just last year, a survey of suicidality in adults with Asperger's syndrome, we found a worryingly high rate of such psychiatric or mental health issues. For example, two thirds of adults with Asperger's reporting suicidal thoughts and feelings and a third of adults with Asperger's syndrome reporting that they'd made plans to commit suicide or had even attempted suicide. So very serious psychiatric risk, but covered, I think, just as easily by the term condition as with disorder. Last argument that, at least in the US, the term disorder is what gets you insurance cover. Well, that may be the case, but whether DSM or the International Classification of Diseases that we have in Europe calls it disorder or condition, I don't think insurance cover um, should only be available um, depending on the terminology. We should be able to lead the classification systems and dialogue with the insurance companies to make sure uh, cover is available, whatever term we as scientists or as the autism community decide. So here are my conclusions. I think the term disorder We've inherited it. Maybe um, in now time to have a rethink. It's potentially stigmatizing to tell someone that they are disordered. I think it may be inaccurate because there's no evidence the system is broken and incompatible with notions of difference or talent. I think the term condition equally captures the seriousness of autism as a disability, as uh, carrying with it mental health issues suffering and severity. And maybe we should just go back to where we started and just simply call it autism. Thank you very much.